And thank you uh, for joining us this morning at what we think is a pretty exciting webinar. Really, as always, really appreciate an effort to dial in and we're excited about an opportunity that we want to put in front in front of you and hopefully you get as excited as well. Th there is one uh, investor who's dialed in from the airport. I spoke to him yesterday. He's on his way to Los Angeles with his family to take them to Disneyland. And yet he found <laughs> the opportunity to listen to this as exciting as Disneyland. So, Tony, uh, safe travels, mate. Have a great trip. And thank you for dialing in from the airport. Okay. Uh, Jared, Sam and myself. For those who have dialed into our, quarter, our regular quarterly webinar, you're quite familiar with who, with who we are. We, we're hearing from another individual a little bit later, but I normally go to Sam almost always as the first question to, to just remind those on our calls, Sam, what was the key overriding principles or objectives that Capital Prudential sought to deliver when they created the business around five years ago. Can you just talk to that again? I know we talk about it pretty much every webinar, so you might just want to start there again this morning. Yeah, yeah, I will, Michael. And thank you to all attendees for joining us uh, today. The key objective when we started the business uh, five years ago uh, and the track record we've got behind us now is attributable to the mid-scale property developments that we do. Uh, these are both commercial and resi, uh, and they're all around Australia. And the reason that we have been able to build uh, a portfolio, a diversified portfolio of mid-scale property developments around Australia is because we have put together a strong national network of development managers that are skilled in their geographies, that are skilled in the type of property developments uh, that they can source, and deliver for us. That has been a key objective of ours, um, as our loyal investors would know over the last five years. It also gives us visibility around a long pipeline of development. So whilst our investors see those developments when they're ready to settle, when they're ready to come into our fund, uh, we see them sort of 18 to 24 months before as they come uh, towards us and as we work on those uh, opportunities. Now, one of the things that investors have told us, uh, Michael, over the last five years is whilst they're incredibly happy that we have delivered on exactly what we've said we're going to do over the last five years, uh, with their regular quarterly interest payments that we pay, um, and with the uh, redemptions that we honour when people come to the end, although majority, as we know, uh, have rolled, um, is that in some cases, they want exposure to the equity side of these transactions. They can see that they're highly attractive mid-scale development opportunities. And, and some investors have said to us, it's great that you give me this regular uh, predictable income, but can I get some exposure to that equity as well? And really what we're doing here is responding uh, to what our investors have said to us. And of course, there are some investors we've spoken to that have said to us, come back. Uh, when you've got some exposure uh, to that equity upside. So really, Michael, this is not a change uh, to our business in the sense that we're changing what we're doing around assets. Uh, this is a change in terms of broadening our product suite for our loyal investors. Um, so very much complementary uh, to what we've been doing over the last five years. And, and as you said, a fantastic opportunity and, and, you know, a fantastic stage of our business to get to, um, to be able to now offer this out to our investor network. Thanks, Sam. So really, it's very consistent with the goals and objectives that we set. We're just really leveraging our great expertise in the area of property development. We've just redefined the way we deliver those returns based on demand from some of our investors. Now, a bit later, I will take us through the actual structure and the investment objective of this particular opportunity that we are discussing today. But one thing that I'll say right now is that this opportunity will rely on less assets to deliver the outcome than our notes program, which for those who invested in our secured income notes, you're aware it's a diversified pool of property developments throughout the country. This will be more likely to be one or two specific assets. So today, one of the key objectives is to talk about the targeted assets that will go into this fund. And, and to start us off, I'm going to go to Jared and ask Jared 
uh, a pretty simple question. Jared, how did you go about selecting the types of assets that uh, you believe will help deliver the investment objective in this in, in this equity fund? Thanks, Michael. Welcome, everyone. And another thing that's changed is Michael's got a new, much more snazzy <laughs> outfit for his presentation. He usually has the three-piece blue suit, but new fund, uh, new fund, new <laughs> outfit. Looks very sharp. Um, Dev Equity Fund, I think, look, this is very much a generic product that's in the market from a, you know equity exposure point of view, Michael. And, and one of the things that Sam touched on for our investor base was the opportunity to participate in in some of that equity upside, um, which is obviously, you know, getting the benefit of coming on the journey with the development and if it performs well, getting your share of that equity upside. I think for us, though, we still need to maintain the sort of our view of the world of how we manage developments and bring the expertise that we do to get sites. It's still about delivering sites within a, you know, a, a time frame that we commit to to ensure the investors get their return. So, um Clancy will come on in a minute and talk specifically about the assets, but as far as the actual why we selected the type of properties we have as seed assets is they've got inbuilt liquidity within the project. So whilst you're not getting the, the diversified portfolio across the country like you talked about, the seed assets we've got, for example, um, you can a block of land has already been pre-sold to a third party. So part of the site is actually already pre-contracted to be on-sold to a third party buyer. And what that does is immediately you've got liquidity built into the project because early on in the project, you don't have to wait till the end. We actually sell that portion of the site, which frees up cash flow to, you know, for a number of things to help fund the future construction drawdowns as well. There could be some um, equity return to the investors that, you know, there's a myriad of things you can do, but you're not waiting for your entire uh, capital to come back at the end of the project within the project. So it'll make a bit more sense when Clancy talks more about the assets. The other one is so the, the project you can see on the on the screen is Jandicott, which is um, essentially ready to go. You know this is this has got a, a development approval, and, and Clancy will talk about the details a bit more. But we've actually got uh, over forty strata warehouses within that development. So again, you haven't got a single exposure to one large property, which then exposes you to the delays at the end if you can't sell that one property. You've actually got a lot of smaller properties within the site. Another key advantage of that, the value of those sales comes down, so you're paying a lower price, so you've got a broader market to sell to. So whilst it's a different product to uh, the Diversified Development Fund, a lot of the same logic and de-risking applies on, on how we actually approach these assets and how we deliver them, and that's an advantage for this funding uh, this funding structure as well. So you, you'll see a bit of a theme with the first two assets that are there. They're bigger sites, which gives us the buying power because the rate per metre, you know, to buy this land is lower. So you've got more inbuilt return in there, but they still have smaller exit points along the way. So we're we'll trying to manage that. We're using our same philosophy as we typically do to approach this fund the same way we would with uh, with every other fund. Thank, and, thanks, Jared. And just on Clancy, so um, so Clancy will talk specifically about the assets and uh, we welcome Clancy, I think, at the start of the year to the to the business and we're pretty excited to get Clancy on board you know he's strong very strong background with uh, with Mervac so big listed developer you know Clancy's based in Sydney so a lot of east coast exposure as well and and you know network within that those particular markets you know also strong mixed use development delivery expertise so we're talking you know delivered much bigger assets from a master plan point of view and a lot of those skills become very relevant when you're looking at a large site and how you break it down into smaller bite-sized chunks so um, yeah, we're very excited to bring Clancy on board and I'll, um, yeah, when you can, Michael, throw over to Clancy to talk about the assets. Well, let's let's do that right now. Clancy, welcome to the webinar. Let's go to, let's let's look at Jandicott. Can, can you just start by explaining why Jandicott for this type of asset that is going into this equity fund? Sure. Thanks, Michael. And thanks, Jared, for that uh, introduction. So for, for those that don't know, Jandicott's over in Perth in WA. Um, it's about 22 k's from the Perth CBD, and the answer to, to Michael's question as to why we chose that as the, that location for for this type of asset is that it's a key growth precinct. It's right next door to Jandicott Airport, um, but also as you can see on the image on the left there, it's immediately adjacent to the Quinana Freeway, which gives it massive exposure. It's also just up the road from Coburn Central, which is a key regional shopping centre. Um, and then further underpinning some of those key macro elements to the location is the investment that's happening in the area. So there's a new urban surf park being built just around the corner. 
as well as you can see on the image there, the green of the golf course, that's actually just been rezoned to become residential. So there's a lot of money flowing into the area, which means that assets like these strata industrial warehouses become quite desirable. Um, in so, terms of, of, sorry, Michael. Sorry, go on, no, continue. Yep, so it's still on the theme of why Jandicott, yep. Sure. So and the other key thing for, for us in, in the WA market is making sure we've got a resource on the ground that understands the the asset and, and um, has the connections and the network within the market. And we've got a great uh, resource in that with Jack Bennett, who was the one who acquired this site for us. And he's also the one that will, will deliver it for us, which is excellent in terms of providing us with um, the network we need in the area. Brilliant. So, OK, so we've got the location right. It seems uh, one of the challenges for a few years now has been the careful selection of the builder. Can you talk through how we went about appointing the builder to this project? Yeah, for sure, and you're right. Obviously, um, it's a key topic at the moment as, as, as to who the builder is. So we went through a careful process of, of working through a list of reputable builders that, that work on this type of construction. Uh, we went out to a, a pricing on a few of those that we thought were the right people. Um, and we then narrowed it down to a builder that we've worked with in the past. So the builder that we're proposing on this project was actually just recently completed Maddington asset for us. Um, they did a fantastic job of that. And we felt like we had a, a fantastic tr trusting relationship with them, um, which gave us a lot of confidence that they were the right person. Um, so the next step has been with them is to work through their price and and get it right, make sure that all the right inclusions are in there um, and then get them to the point which we're at now, which is finalising the design and construct contract with them. So it's a it's a stage process of narrowing it down to the right builder, finding the builder that you can trust and then getting to a point where you're confident in the contract that you're signing with them so that most of the risk has been um, eliminated and you're really just working together to deliver the asset. And you mentioned Maddington. So just to remind those who might be new to these calls, when when Capital Prudential, we run a panel of builders around, around the country, and before we appoint any any builder, we also run a financial assessment, and we would have done that prior to the commencement of the Maddington asset. So, I mean, our builders traditionally are fairly thinly capitalised, so it's really important to do as much work as possible to get a handle on their, vi their financial viability. Um, so that goes without saying, we do that with, uh, with all builders. So, Okay, so we've got a really good location for a great asset, um, really confident in the capability, the experience of the builder. As Sam mentioned, nothing has really changed in terms of what we uh, and how we deliver property development assets. We build to sell, to extract the profit in those developments for our investors. That means we always need to be thinking about our exit strategy upon practical completion. So really important Point, Clancy, can you talk to that point? What is the exit strategy to actually realise value? Sure. And I think obviously the first step to, to any exit strategy is making sure you've got the product right. Uh, and Jared touched on this, but that small format industrial space has been um, a space that we found excellent in terms of providing us with a broad range of product. So you'll see uh, coming up on the next page there, a, um, a floor plan layout of the project and you'll see that there's varying sizes, uh, varying sort of locations within the, the precinct as well. So getting that product right, making sure that you've got product that satisfies a broad range of the market. And what's great about these industrial units is you've got owner occupiers, you've got builders and tradesmen, you've got investors, uh, there's even that element of man shed, so people uh, who, who need to store excess you know, equipment or whatever. There's a, a huge market that we can we can sell to, and that also broadens the investor market because if there's a good owner occupier market, then investors always want to be there because there'll always be good rental returns. Um, the other key element to that is obviously you can see there that there's a huge amount of parking in the precinct. There's container set downs and getting the design right in terms of racking heights, um, slabs, having mezzanines, all those sort of things. So getting that product right is the first step. Um, and which we've done, and we've got a DA approval now for, as Jared mentioned, just over 40 um, industrial warehouses there. 
Um, the next step is obviously then the pre-sale campaign. And we actually have launched a pre-sale campaign for this project. We've had over 200 inquiries. Uh, we've got six co signed contracts and we've got a few more in negotiation. And even over the last few days, we've been working with buyers on multiple lots. So starting to really show confidence that, that, that the product's right, the pricing's right and everything. Um, a big pre-sale campaign is obviously one of the key elements to de-risking and that extra exit strategy. So the intention would be for the vast majority of this project to be sold prior to the construction completion, which gives uh, both ourselves and our investors confidence that they'll, they'll be getting the money out toward the end. Um, the other key element that Jared touched on, though, is that there's a parcel of land that's just to the bottom of the screen there. You can see that small triangle that we have agreed a contract with to sell to a, another owner occupier who build their own facility on that site. And that gives us um, substantial confidence in entering into the transaction, completing a sale quite, quite quickly after that, as Jared mentioned, getting some more liquidity um, and, and giving us all confidence that we'll be able to continue with the construction and get to that completion. Brilliant. So Jandicott, you know, lead target asset, great location, great asset, a strong builder in place and a really well developed exit strategy already. So that is wonderful. There's another target asset uh, in the portfolio. Now I'm going to pronounce this incorrectly because I'm not from Victoria. I'm going to say Corio, but you're going to say you, you you'll explain how to say the word. You'll uh, can you talk can you talk to this asset at Corio, please? Sure. Um, my understanding is that if you're from Geelong, it's Corio. Corio, there you go. That's all right. Um, so as I just mentioned, it's uh, just to the northern part of Geelong. You can see there from the map um, to the southwest of the Melbourne CBD or Melbourne City. Um, it's an excellent exposure to this site. Anyone who, who happens to be from Melbourne or who has done this trip, um, You'll know driving down the Princess Highway to get to the Surf Coast for your weekend away, most people will pull into the Dan Murphy's, which is immediately next door, and they'll they'll get their their case of beer or their bottle of wine that they'll then take on to their um to their holiday. So great exposure for the site for this one. It's a slightly different project here. So instead of the industrial warehouses targeting two fast foods, which you can see there at the front, um, which are the two pink. Um, and then about three and a half thousand square metres of large format retail space, which is the um, orange elements or the, the uh, yellow elements. And then the, um, the, the dark orange element you can see to the right of the screen there, um, that is another great opportunity for a parcel of land to be sold off to another occupier or developer and allow us to do that same de-risking um, flow back of capital into the project and give us some confidence in delivery of the elements that we have for construction. Um, in terms of continuing to talk to that de-risking piece, so what's great about this site is that all of the proposed uses are actually approvable under the planning scheme, so no controversies in terms of planning at all. Um, and we actually have had a meeting with council earlier this year and got some strong feedback that they, they would support this development once the DA was submitted. And then following on from that, their strong feedback and, and really underpinning that confidence we have in the location is we've had some really, really good feedback from potential tenants for this space. So we've got four heads of agreement uh, received and we're negotiating further prospects prior to locking in what we think is the best scheme, the best sizes and everything. Um, and then we'll be submitting the DA off the back of that. So you can probably tell from, from what I've said here, that um, this one's probably a little bit more of a, a longer date on it. But as always, what's really important is that we try and progress the projects as much as we can. And that's really consistent with our philosophy about de-risking any project prior to it entering any of our funds. Thanks, Clancy. And just to remind uh, those on the call, Capital Prudential uses um, our own balance sheet when we do de-risking for, for assets. So um, we've maintained that, that philosophy for this asset as well. That is brilliant. Clancy, thank you. This is your inaugural webinar performance, solid, well-dressed. It's actually sitting in our Adelaide office as well. So welcome to Adelaide, mate. Catch up soon. Yeah, it's great. Thank you. Let's get to the fund. So we've gone through the assets that will drive the performance. So this is different to the secured income notes. This has an investment objective which is to outperform an 18% per annum investment return, which will flow to the investor. Why does that flow to the investor? The investor in this structure is the owner of the assets. It's an equity fund. 
So it's also a closed ended fund. So unlike the notes program, we have uh, a entry point that needs to be met for you to participate in this fund. So the rate of return we think is extremely attractive at 18% per annum. We're targeting returns in excess of that. And we, we are incentivizing ourselves to do better than 18% per annum by having a performance target. The performance target, for those who are used to these structures, is what we call a hard performance target. It only applies once we hit the 18% per annum return to the investor. If we exceed the 18%, let's say we deliver 20% per annum, then we share in 50% of the upside above 18. You maintain your full 18, so you would get the one out of that extra 2%. You get 19% and we get we get 1% of that performance, our performance. So we think it's a really attractive rate of return. It has a end date of a three-year period. So investors going into this fund should be thinking, targeting an 18% per annum, hopefully more per annum over a three-year period. There may be some distributions, but I think just to be conservative, you should go into this vehicle thinking it'll be a lar largely a capital play and the rate of return will be delivered at the end of the three-year period. I mentioned that uh, it has a end date being closed-ended. We need to have investors commit to investing in this vehicle by the 5th of July. So it gives us a couple of weeks uh, to make a decision, just, just under. The minimum application is $50,000. It's for wholesale clients only. Earlier on, you would have received an email which had an ability to, res to put a reserve amount if you wanted to participate in this fund. We will reissue that email. So for those who are interested in putting forward a commitment to invest in this fund, you'll be receiving something fairly soon. But July 5 is a really important date. So there's an, there's an appetite to participate in an equity fund with one or two really strong assets where we're targeting an 18% per annum and hopefully more for the investor over a three-year timeline. This is the fund that you need to sort of um, you know come back to us reasonably quickly. For those who want more information, you can reach out to Sam or myself, or indeed we're happy to put you in touch with Jared or Clancy if you wanted more detail around the assets, more than happy to share uh, more information and answer any specific questions. But, you know, we are very excited by, as Sam said early on, you know, this is in response to some of our investors saying, I love the Secured Notes program, but I wouldn't mind being an owner of some of those assets and sharing in the actual returns that those assets deliver. So this is precisely the opportunity that we've created to cater for those investors that do want to own the assets and share in those, those potential upside returns. So guys, uh, that is the end of the webinar. It's gone about 20 odd minutes. Please come back to us if you want any more information. As I said, July 5 will be here before you know it. So we're really excited. Hopefully you're excited as well. I want to thank Clancy again. I want to thank Jared. I want to thank Sam. More importantly, I want to thank all those who made an effort to dial in. As always, we really appreciate the loyalty and the interest you, you take in Capital Prudential. Um, look forward to chatting again very soon. Enjoy the rest of the day, guys. Thank you.